Hello again, Lee Carson from the fellowship class of the First Methodist Church in uh, Boulder, Texas. Uh, all of you who are regular class members are used to me. Those that aren't, well, we're glad to have you. Uh, I haven't mentioned it for a while, but any time you want to contact me or talk about a lesson, you're welcome to. Uh, my email address is leecarson at juno.com. Easy one to remember. And now getting on with our class. Title of our lesson today is Our Always Faithful God. Last week's lesson, uh, we started with the book of Daniel. And he and his three buddies, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, refused to eat the meat and drink the wine from the king's table. Nebuchadnezzar wanted them to be happy and in the finest of health, that they might serve in the running of the kingdom. Daniel managed to get them served vegetables and water and proved that they were in even better health than those that ate the king's food. The king, after they uh, were finished, uh, the king appointed Daniel over all Babylon and his friends as administrators. In this week's lesson, Nebuchadnezzar has made a gold statue 90 feet tall and 9 feet wide and ordered all the provincial officials to its dedication. They all stood in front of the statue while the herald proclaimed loudly, Peoples and nations of all languages, this is what you must do. When you hear the sound of the horn, the pipe, the zither, the lyre, the harp, the flute, and every kind of instrument, you must bow down and worship the gold statue. Anyone who will not bow down and worship will be thrown into a flaming furnace. So when they all heard the sound of all the instruments, they bowed down, worshiped the gold statue that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Envious of the four Jews, some Chaldeans saw the chance to attack them. And they came forward and said to King Nebuchadnezzar on the side, Long live the king. Your majesty, you gave a command that everyone who hears the sound of all these instruments should bow down and worship the golden statue. Anyone who wouldn't bow down and worship would be thrown into a furnace of flaming fire. But there are some Jews, ones you appointed, who didn't bow down. These are the ones you appointed to administer Babylon, specifically Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who have ignored your command. They don't serve your gods, and they don't worship the golden statue you've set up. In a violent rage, Nebuchadnezzar ordered them to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and they were brought before the king. Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, is it true that you don't serve my gods or worship the gold statue I've set up? If you're ready now to do so, bow down and worship the gold statue I've made when you hear the sound of the instruments. But if you won't worship it, you will be thrown straight into the furnace of flaming fire. Then what God will rescue from my power? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered the king. We don't need to answer your question. If our God, the one we serve, is able to rescue us from the furnace of flaming fire and from your power, your majesty, then let him rescue us. But if he doesn't, know this for certain, your majesty. We will never serve your gods or worship the gold statue you've set up. Now this is where today's scripture begins. And it comes from the third chapter of Daniel, the 19th to the 30th verses. Nebuchadnezzar was filled with rage and his face twisted beyond recognition because of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. In response, he commanded that the furnaces be heated to seven times its normal heat. He told some of the strongest men in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the furnace of flaming fire. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were bound, still dressed in all their clothes, and thrown into the furnace of flaming fire. Now the king's command had been rash and the furnace was heated to such an extreme temperature that the fire's flame killed the men who carried Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to it. So these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell bound into the furnace of flaming fire. 
fire. Then King Nebuchadnezzar jumped up and in shock, he said to his associates, didn't we throw three men bound into the fire? They answered the king, certainly your majesty. He replied, look, I see four men unbound walking around inside the fire and they aren't hurt. And the fourth one looks like one of the gods. Nebuchadnezzar went near the opening of the furnace of flaming fire and said, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, servants of the most high God, come out, come here. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire. The chief administrators, the ministers, governors, and king's associates crowded around to look at them. The fire hadn't done anything to them. Their hair wasn't singed. Their garments looked the same as before. They didn't even smell like fire. Nebuchadnezzar declared, May the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be praised. He sent his messenger to rescue his servants who trusted him. They ignored the king's order to sacrificing their bodies because they wouldn't serve or worship any god but their god. I now issue a decree to every people, nation, and language, whoever speaks disrespectfully about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego's god will be torn limb from limb and their houses made a trash heap because there is no other god who could rescue like this. Then the king made Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego prosperous in the province of Babylon. The key verse from that scripture uh, is the 28. Nebuchadnezzar declared, may the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be praised. He sent his messenger to rescue his servants who trusted him. They ignored the king's order, sacrificing their bodies because they wouldn't serve or worship any God but their God. To God's people, the purpose of today's lesson is to help God's people endure in faith despite the consequences. John F. Kennedy's book, Profiles in Courage, profiled the careers of eight senators who brought change to the nation through their sacrificial and unpopular positions. John Quincy Adams' political views caused him to break away from the Federalist Party. Edmund G. Ross voted to acquit a sitting president, and Robert Taft criticized the process of trying Nazi war criminals. Kennedy wanted his readers to know that living out their consciences often brought out severe criticism, ostracism, and even political ruin for some. He wanted them to know that the courage that brings about constructive change for the good, good of all, across party and social lines. It won a Pulitzer Prize and the JFK Profile and Courage Foundation was founded to recognize public officials who demonstrate bravery and integrity in civic leadership. In about 1947, I was in high school. I was riding home on the bus day one day. World War II had just ended and we'd been talking in civics class about how much better it was gonna be now that the war was over. Even the Negroes, that's the word we used back then, were living separate but equal lives. We were passing the black school, which was from the first through eighth grades. Black kids who, went, who wanted were bused into high school in Dallas every day. A black school bus passed us and it looked pretty beat up and rough. And that started a conversation on black education. Now this is a bunch of high school boys talking. One of the guys knew some black kids and he told us what he'd heard about our old buses that were passed down to them, along with textbooks. The textbooks were even ragged and everything else that was passed down. And then we started talking about this separate but equal thing. What did it really mean? When John Lewis was given the JFK award, he said that he'd been frustrated with the hypocrisy uh, with liberty and justice for all. The humiliation and segregated bathrooms, restaurants, substandard schools, these all led to the right thing in participating in the civil rights movement. It's always made me feel free when he knew he had done the right thing, he said. This was the first time in my life I ever questioned in my mind what segregation really meant. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego's experience 
showed that doing the right thing can be trying, but God is always in the righteousness. The Daniel we've been studying is about the Jews of the diaspora. The diaspora is the Jews that have been moved away from their homeland. It's the Jews that aren't living in Judea and Israel. Uh, they worked, they worshiped among the Gentiles. Last week's lesson centered on the story over the conflicts in food and the conflict between the Babylonian king's commands and God's commandments. Uh, the the uh, meat that was being given was meat that had been sacrificed to their gods. And the wine was not blessed like it was supposed to be. So the food, well, basically the meat and the wine, was not what the Jews were supposed to be eating. That's where the contention came. Bowing to a golden statue and worshiping foreign gods was a direct violation of God's commandments. Straight off, it violated the Shema. We've talked about the Shema before. The first mention of it comes from Deuteronomy 6, the fourth through nine verses. The Shema says, Israel, listen, our God is the Lord, only the Lord. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your being, and all your strength. These words that I am commanding you today must always be on your minds. Recite them to your children. Talk about them when you're sitting around your house and when you're out and about, when you're lying down, when you're getting up. Tie them on your hand as a sign. They should be on your forehead as a symbol. Write them on your house door frame and on your city's gates. The Shema was and still is important to the Jews. The Shema was important to Jesus. Remember Jesus saying this? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your being, and all your strength. Also, the first two of the Ten Commandments, Deuteronomy 5, 7, and 8, the first two commandments say, you must have no other gods before me, the second, do not make an idol for yourself. Idol worship was the reason that God allowed them to be conquered and taken into exile. The reason for the Chaldean officials tattling was their jealousy. Daniel, Shadrach, <laughs> I've said that so many times I can't say it again. Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had proved themselves to be more intelligent, more capable of learning, and more industrious than the Chaldeans. It had landed, landed them better jobs with more respect and more rewards. The exchange between Nebuchadnezzar and these Jewish men showed the great strength of their faith, even though God had not promised them anything. Dinner at our house falls every evening, uh, right around 6.30, the same time as the Wheel of Fortune television show comes on. When we bought our current TV, it wouldn't fit our old TV stand, so I built a new one. Not only was the stand larger to accommodate the new TV, but I made it so it swiveled from one side to the other. Turn one way, it faced the family room, turn it the other way, it faced the dining room. Guess what we watch during dinner most evenings? On the uh, Wheel of Fortune, there's a $10,000 card that shows on one of the spaces. The front side, one side says uh, what the card is. The other side has either $10,000 on it or on the other side, bankrupt. It was your choice if you wanted to pick it up. When you picked it up and turned it over, it was a chance. It could say $10,000, it could say bankrupt. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had their choice bow down or not bow down. They didn't know what God's plan for the moment was, but they did have faith that God would have the final word. On Wheel of Fortune, it's one of two things, win big or lose big. We don't know the outcome, but we do know that God loves us and it will be for the good if we have faith in him. So the card that we turn up and look at the back on is a win-win. We're going to win either way. 
In Isaiah 55, 8, God speaks to Isaiah saying, My plans aren't your plans, nor are your ways my ways. God's, inf in <laughs> God's infinite ways are, done, are above and beyond our limited ways. The three men didn't know what the outcome would be, but they did know who held the fate of their fortune. Nebuchadnezzar's pride was out of control. His rage showed the contrast between him and the three men who remained calm through the whole experience. I've talked about it before, but one of the things that we really miss in this class is not being able to have a, a discussion. So I ask some questions and then I answer them. And uh, hopefully they may answer some of your thoughts. So what is spiritual pride and how might we address it? Well, the key to it is respect for God, respect for ourselves, and respect for others. Kind of the same thing as the Shem. Love the Lord your God, love your neighbor as yourself. Nebuchadnezzar's pride and self-importance caused him to disrespect the gift and graces of these three Hebrew men. Their faith in God was strong, so they chose not to bow down to Nebuchadnezzar's God and calmly told the king they would keep their faith no matter what. Nebuchadnezzar showed the pomposity and irrationality brought on by his anger. The four men in the fire is not the fourth man in the fire is not identified. He could have been an angel, angel of the Lord, or he might even have been Jesus himself. We don't know. It's only a guess, but it was certainly enough to add to Nebuchadnezzar's certainty that God of these men had far more power than he himself did. What have we learned about the God of Israel? Well, the king's description of what he saw got his attention. This powerful God could do anything. Paul and Silas were thrown into prison on a false charge because they'd upset some merchants. They were locked deep in the jail with guards all around them. What did they do? They laid there and sang him, sang him, prayed. And then God threw open all the jail doors, putting fear into the officials. God delivers us of some situations and through others if we have faith and stay cool. We don't know if Nebuchadnezzar ever bowed down and prayed to God, but the scripture tells us that he certainly showed tremendous respect. How can we remain faithful when we're not sure of the outcome? Well, for one thing, we can remain faithful because of God's promises. God has never broken a promise. And he's always been faithful to his word. In Jeremiah 29, 10 to 14, he promised these things. The Lord proclaims when Babylon 70 years are up, I will come and fulfill my gracious promise to bring you back to this place. Now he's speaking to the Jews that are in exile who have been taken to Babylon. And I go on. I know the plans I have in mind for you, declares the Lord. They are plans for peace, not disaster, to give you a future filled with hope. When you call me and come and pray to me, I will listen to you. When you search for me, yes, search for me with all your heart and you'll find me. I will be present for you, declares the Lord, and I will end your captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and places where I've scattered you. And I bring you home after your long exile, declares the Lord. And God did all these things. We read through the scriptures, we find that they were in exile some 70, 75 years. What memories of past victories bring praise to your heart? I don't know if you can call these as victories or not, but I listed these things. But he has shown me great love and forgiveness of my sins. He gave me a good wife that shares my faith and was a good mother to our children. He gave me many good friends and neighbors. He has promised me a wonderful future home. And at 86, he's already given me a long life. What have we learned about faithfulness to God? 
Faith in God brought me his son. Faith in him brings me joy and peace. Faith brings me relief from worry and relieves my pain. I want to close with one last story. There was a young nurse who wanted desperately to be a surgical nurse and had just finished nursing school and been assigned to a surgeon. He would be the one who had final say over her qualifications and ability. After several weeks working for him, he told her one day to scrub and get ready. He had a simple appendectomy to perform and he wanted her to assist him. She was thrilled. Her big chance had come when the surgeon finished all had gone well. The surgeon said, I'm all finished as soon as I close. The young nurse said, you can't yet doctor. One of our sponges is missing. The doctor said, I'm the surgeon and we're ready to close. Red faced and putting her future and her career on the line. She said, doctor, you can't. If that lost sponge was left inside, it could be disastrous for our patient. The doctor smiled, pointed down as he moved his foot, exposing the sponge. He said, you'll do. No matter how small or insignificant it might be, anything we choose to put ahead of God is a test, like the small folded piece of gauze it mattered. Let us pray. Our God and Father, there are so many little things that we want so badly, we put ahead of you. Forgive us for this, Father, and remind us that when we see anything that's in conflict with our faith, that you remind us of it, that we might stay faithful to you and to do the work that Jesus left for us when he left. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.